Welcome to ID the Future, a podcast of Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. On this episode of ID the Future, we listen in on a few minutes from a recent lecture given by Discovery Institute senior fellow, biologist Michael Denton. We've all heard of the importance of photosynthesis as an oxygen-creating process. In this segment, Denton explains the remarkable set of coincidences which makes the creation of oxygen through photosynthesis possible, from the specific energy of visible light to the unique properties of water. This degree of improbability screams design. Anyway, back to Huxley's questions, right? So basically what I've done in the first part of the talk is I've said that the medieval men believed in the interconnectedness of everything, that man was at home in the universe, okay? And then I've said that for three centuries, science slowly stripped away that idea. And then from the works of Henderson, the discoveries of biochemistry, the discoveries of the properties of the carbon atom, the way carbon is made in the stars, suddenly a reconnection is beginning to emerge, tentatively perhaps at the moment, but it seems to be coming. So there's a great trend now developing back to that medieval conception of microcosmos and macrocosmos, right? And the question of questions, of course, is what's our place in nature? I think that science is now established, and I would say that I've just reviewed a whole lot of work by recent astrobiologists and people studying extraterrestrial life and looking for life in space. And I think everybody agrees that carbon is the unique atom and the universe is uniquely fit for carbon-based life as we see on Earth, right? But what about humans, right? So now I'm going to say something about the fitness of nature for oxidative metabolism for advanced forms of life. Constant activities of beings like ourselves require energy. And, the en and great quantities of metabolic energy. And basically, the only atom in the periodic table that's capable of delivering this energy is oxygen. And we get all our energy by the slow combustion of hydrocarbons. It's the same as a fire. And it's not just me that's saying this. What I'm saying is that, in fact, oxygen is the signature of complex life. If you're going to have complex life needing a lot of energy anywhere in the universe, you're going to have to use oxygen. It's just a recent paper here just to show you, these aren't my ideas, why oxygen is required by complex life and habitable planets. It's universally accepted that, in fact, NASA scientists are looking for oxygen on other planets because oxygen on another planet means that, in fact, there's probably photosynthesis and there may well be complex life. Okay? So oxygen is, in fact, the chosen atom, like carbon, to give energy to complex forms of life. The oxidation of hydrocarbon is a reaction that powers the world. Mammals and higher life forms obtain their energy from the oxidation of sugars and fats, reduced carbon compounds. Oxygen plus reduced carbon gives us water and carbon dioxide, chemical energy and heat. And it's exactly the same that powers the world of steam <laughs> and the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, because that was essentially getting energy by burning coal, wood in oxygen, okay? So it was the same source of energy. Remarkably, as you're sitting there now, you require 250 mils of pure oxygen per minute to provide the energy for the body. I think that's a remarkable thing. A whole cup every minute of pure oxygen you require to maintain the energy levels in the body. So we require a lot of this oxygen to keep us going. Now, one of the things about oxygen is that, in fact, not all organisms need oxygen. And this is why we're starting to focus on higher organisms like ourselves. Many organisms can get by without oxygen. There are many other chemical means of getting energy for living things. And these are just some of the chemical reactions just down here, which might be used instead of using oxygen. So living things can get energy from other chemical sources, and extremophile microbes derive metabolic energy from many different chemical reactions. So when we talk about the fitness of the universe for oxygen, and to provide oxygen for organisms like us, we're starting to focus on beings like ourselves. okay? The way that oxygen is manufactured in, on our planet is by photosynthesis. And once again, it's universally accepted that, in fact, anywhere in the universe where you get a lot of oxygen, you're going to have to strip that oxygen, probably from water, in a photochemical process, something like photosynthesis. Okay? Photosynthesis is carbon dioxide plus water plus solar energy produced hydrocarbons. So we get oxygen by the process of photosynthesis. And what energy does the photosynthesis need? It's a very small region of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is the visual region. This is the region which powers photosynthesis, okay? So if you look at the fitness of radiant energy, that's the electromagnetic spectrum, 
This is the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that has the right energy levels for photosynthesis. In fact, it's light. Light energy has the correct characteristics to raise the atoms of organic chemistry to levels for chemical interactions. So light is the right electromagnetic energy for photosynthesis, okay? Well, when you look at the sun, you find the sun turns out nearly all of its energy in the visible spectrum. <laughs> so the sun is pouring out just the energy you need for photosynthesis, okay? And so the radiant energy output of the sun happens to be in exactly the same region of the electromagnetic spectrum that you need for photosynthesis. <laughs> Convenient coincidence. So you can put down these two little diagrams. Here is the part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which happens to be light, the visual region, which is appropriate for photochemistry, for photosynthesis, and this is the radiant output of the sun. And of course, they coincide, okay? So the cosmos is not only seeded with the atoms of life, it's bathed in the light you need for photosynthesis, which produces oxygen for higher organisms like ourselves. okay? Well, if you're going to get the light of the sun to the planetary surface, it has to come through the atmosphere. And our atmosphere, which is the atmosphere of a carbon-based life-bearing planet, contains nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. And whenever you get carbon-based life, you're going to have to have oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water vapor in the atmosphere of the planet, okay? And so these are gases which absorb incoming electromagnetic radiation. And guess what? Incredibly, and this is a really incredible thing, the atmosphere, oxygen, water vapor, carbon dioxide, what you have, it lets through the light of the sun and the part of the electromagnetic spectrum, the visual region, which is just what you need for photosynthesis, right down to the surface of the planet. And all the other gamma radiation, UV, dangerous microwaves are absorbed by the atmosphere. What are these atmospheric gases? Water vapor, CO2, oxygen, the very key gases that you're going to have in a carbon-based biosphere. So the light pours out the light of life, and it goes right through the atmosphere to the surface of the planet, right? And the UV and many of the harmful radiations are absorbed by the gases, but the crucial light for photosynthesis to make oxygen goes right through to the surface of the planet. So this is what we have now. We have the radiant energy output of the sun. The light you need for photosynthesis is able to go right down to the planetary surface. If that wasn't the case, there'd be no complex life on the cosmos, right? If the gases needed for a carbon biosphere absorbed visual light, no oxygen, no complex life, okay? So these are some of the coincidences of nature. Even more remarkable is the fact that water as well lets down light in especially blue light to 500 meters. So it carries the life-giving light for photosynthesis right into the ocean surface waters so that the plankton of the seas can generate oxygen. So what we have here is a very remarkable set of coincidences. Main sequence stars and our sun pour out exactly the light and energy you need for photosynthesis. The atmosphere allows it to get to the surface of the planet and water allows it to sink into the water so photosynthesis can occur in the water. And if you think you should be awed by this because the author of the Encyclopedia Britannica describing these coincidences admits to being awed and it's easy to sympathize. Okay, so there's a definite set of arrangements in nature to get oxygen made on planetary surfaces. And wh why do we need oxygen for guys like you? Because every single minute you're sitting in this room, you're taking up 250 mils of oxygen as you're sitting there. If you go for a run, like Usain Bolt, you'd be using up about five liters a minute. Right? So we need oxygen. As complex organisms, highly metabolic active organisms need oxygen, okay? And the universe gives definite, definite evidence that it's organized now, not just for carbon-based life, not fit for just carbon-based life, but now it's fit to make oxygen for organisms like us. And the coincidences are awesome. That's not my word, that's the mainstream conception of this, that it's an awesome set of coincidences, right? So we can make oxygen on the planetary surface, right? But oxygen's a very, very dangerous element, actually. The oxygen content of the atmosphere we need to get 250 mils of oxygen every minute, you need about 20 to 25 percent of oxygen in the atmosphere, right? If you go up to the top of Mount Everest, you can hardly breathe, right? So you've got to have a considerable amount of oxygen in the atmosphere for us to function as oxygen utilizing organisms, right? You can only get that 250 mils a minute if there's a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere. So let's just think about this for a minute. 
The trouble is that oxygen is a very, very dangerous element. This is Melbourne City a few years ago when they had the, the dangerous bushfires, right? Oxygen is an extremely dangerous element. This is the fire front there advancing towards Melbourne. I'm just showing this to tell you that oxygen is a very, very dangerous element, right? How much can you have to be safe? <clears throat> we have, in fact, 20%. But you can't go much higher than that or you'd have spontaneous combustion. 30 and 40% is very, very dangerous. But guess what? Again, everything seems to be nicely arranged. You can go to 20% with oxygen and you don't have spontaneous combustion all over the world, right? And you need about 20% oxygen in the atmosphere to get that 250 mils breathing in from the atmosphere. So the coincidences are building, right? And they're pointing towards us now. Not extremophiles, not organisms that don't use oxygen, not organisms that might live on in Triton or in the sands of Mars, right? This is organisms that need a lot of oxygen, right? This is a famous quote from Arthur C. Clarke. He couldn't understand why we don't have spontaneous combustion, actually. <laughs> oxygen is such an active atom. I simply don't want to know. <laughs> now, why can we have 20% oxygen in the atmosphere? This is this extraordinarily vigorous, dangerous element, right? And the reason is another coincidence. There's a curious aspect to dioxygen. It tends to be not very active until you get to about 50 degrees. And the reason for this is that, in fact, and this is from an expert on this area, dioxygen, the form of oxygen ambient temperature, is relatively unreactive. This is because an energy barrier which must be overcome to convert the dioxygen to a variety of several high energy species of oxygen in which all the electron spins are paired is much more reactive towards common organic molecules. In other words, there is a certain inertness, a special inertness in dioxygen, which is in the atmosphere, which makes it relatively inactive, below temperatures of about 50 degrees, right? And if it wasn't for this relative inertness of O2, we couldn't have 20% oxygen in the atmosphere. Its activity has been attenuated, you see, very specially, in a unique way. Another coincidence is this. Oxygen is not a greenhouse gas. And that's a very good job, isn't it? Because basically, as oxygen levels increased over the last thousand million years, from nothing to the current levels of about 20%, if it had been a greenhouse gas, forget it, we wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> In fact, oxygen absorbs no incoming radiant heat because it's a diatomic molecule. You need triatomic molecules to be greenhouse gases. So let's be very thankful that there's another coincidence here that dioxygen is not triatomic, it's diatomic, it doesn't absorb any heat. So this huge change in oxygen levels in the history of the Earth can occur without any effect on the heat balance of the Earth, right? So another one of the coincidences in the properties of oxygen which allow us to be sitting in this room now breathing this life-giving gas. Now, a very interesting thing about this on the side is that oxygen has a triatomic form called ozone. And ozone is a greenhouse gas which observes thousands of times more heat than CO2. But it's very unstable, and it exists mainly in the upper atmosphere, where it turns over very quickly. It's a tiny fraction of the amount of oxygen. It does something very interesting, though, ozone. It absorbs ultraviolet light. <laughs> and when do you need to absorb ultraviolet light? When you have green plants on the surface available to the sun. <laughs> so the oxygen, which gives life, also gives life in another sense, because it gives us ozone which happens to be a greenhouse gas, but can do its job in tiny, 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 tiny quantities in the upper atmosphere. That's so absolutely beautiful. The oxygen story is one coincidence after another, facilitating life like you sitting here in this room, okay? It's, um, so we're, we're going back, we're, in, we're now increasingly at home in the universe. The universe is looking increasingly like a vast unity with life like us as one of its central purposes and meanings, okay? You've been listening to an excerpt from a recent lecture by biologist and Discovery Institute senior fellow Michael Denton. For more information about intelligent design, be sure to visit intelligentdesign.org. And for daily news reporting on the debate over evolution, check into evolutionnews.org. ID the Future is copyright 2012 Discovery Institute.